Hi, I'm Amy from the Forest Park Historical Society. I uh, want to make sure while you're watching this, we're filming this during COVID and we're taking all the safety precautions that we can. I am so excited to be doing this tour. This is my very favorite place to uh, come take walks. I highly recommend it if you're in the area. We're going to hit a lot of really great spots in this uh, cemetery to look at. I want to do a shout out for our um, sponsors, which is the Troost Monument. They've got a long history here in Forest Park, one of the very first monument companies um, in Forest Park and also one of the largest privately owned monument companies uh, in the United States. And we're gonna see some pretty important pieces that they have here. Um, they also have a street named after them nearby. So we really wanna thank them as our sponsors. Like I said before, I'm uh, a volunteer with the Historical Society of Forest Park. So a lot of the research uh, that I've done for some of these spots we're gonna be seeing comes from the book, uh, Nature's Choicest Spot. I highly recommend this book if you're interested in a cemetery. There's also some really great uh, web pages that I went to for uh, some of the research. One is forestparkhistory.org, and then on there there's also uh, foresthomecemeteryoverview.weebly.com, but you can get to that from the forestparkhistory.org. Also, findagrave.com is a fantastic website, um, and also the oprfmuseum.org, and then they'll have a link there for Forest Home Cemetery. Like I said, this is one of my very favorite places uh, to walk around and just get a sense of local history. Um, cemeteries like this can really encapsulate just all the generations of people that live nearby. So let me tell you a little bit about the area itself. So this was an area uh, during the last glacial age that there was a, a gravel spit that was through here. And uh, this also uh, area was inhabited by uh, humans, we believe from 8,000 BCE. Uh, Potawatomi Native Americans lived here. We believe that in around 2500 BCE was when uh, people started to be buried here, Native Americans. Um, and then in the uh, 1830s, in 1829 was when there was a treaty with the Potawatomi. And in 1832 was the Black Hawk War where Native Americans were pushed further west. After the Native Americans left the property, then there was a, a, fur, a French fur trapper by Leon Barassa. He lived here reportedly with his uh, Native American wife. And uh, it was said that she wanted to stay here so she could be near the graves of her ancestors. In 1851, this property was then bought by Ferdinand Haas. And uh, he started off as a head of farmer. Um, and nearby relatives, uh, when they passed away, he buried them here. So those were the first white settlers that were buried here. Ferdinand Haas then, uh, he was encouraged to turn this into more of a picnic grove for people to come out and enjoy the, you know, the nature out here. And since there was that gravel spit through here, he uh, excavated that and sold the gravel to the railroad company so that they would draw, uh, make a line out to the, um, what was then the picnic grounds. Uh, it was reported that there were very rowdy picnics here. In fact, he even had to build a jail at, on the property at one point. And there was a boat in the river, the white fawn, that they would go up and down. Then in uh, 1869, the Chicago cemeteries closed. And they, were mo they moved the uh, graves from the Chicago cemetery in uh, what is now Lincoln Park. And it was a big mess. And so, uh, they decided to build a cemetery here, and it was perfect. The land is beautiful. The trains came uh, straight out here. The first cemetery to be built out here was uh, further north, which in 1872 was Concordia, and that is a Lutheran cemetery. And then um, here, they decided to have a, a German-speaking cemetery that was non-denominational and that people that were buried here could put their fraternal organizational symbols on their headstones, which you can't do in Concordia. And that's gonna be really important as we keep going uh, through this. So it was called, the German part was called Waldheim. And then they, there was an American section or an English speaking section, uh, still non-denominational, to the south of here that was Forest Home. And then uh, they combined in the 1960s, there was a new owner. Um, I should back up a little bit, in the 1950s, We'll see this too, the Eisenhower cuts right in between the two cemeteries. They had to move quite a number of bodies and it took quite some time. Um, and then we're here now. So we're gonna start off uh, at the front of the cemetery and we're gonna look at uh, some of the Roma graves. 
So we are now in the front of the cemetery and behind me is the Roma section or um, the politically incorrect term is gypsies. Uh, the Roma have a very interesting relationship with, the, with death. Um, they believe that the dead are still very much with us and so it's a very vibrant area. You will see a lot of times people have uh, offerings that they've left for the dead and the deceased. Uh, the funerals are very elaborate. Uh, I haven't been able to be here during a funeral but I came one morning very early after there was one and uh, in front of the grave were, uh, was a bottle of wine, a bottle of whiskey, a bottle of vodka, uh, the deceased's favorite sandwich. A lot of traditional graves will have benches, but the Roma will have uh, what look like cafe tables because they do come out here and they very much celebrate occasions uh, with the dead. Um, and some of the engravings are very interesting and behind me, um, you'll see that on this headstone it says ESP. Um, I don't know if she was a fortune teller. We will see another Roma grave where the, it says fortune teller on the grave. So these are very cool graves to come and explore. Let's keep going. So I feel like I should warn you a little bit in that uh, my tour is gonna be a little different than other people's tours. I hike here a lot and so there's a lot of these uh, graves that are super interesting to me and I've looked them up on Find a Grave or on, online. So um, we'll probably make some discoveries that uh, maybe aren't on other tours and if I miss something on your favorite tour um, you know you can add that uh, suggestion for a future video but while we're here I wanted to visit John Harold Leahy and he uh, went by the name of Bill because that was his favorite movie co uh, cowboy um, he went on a bombing mission in France and he and three others were killed in that crash and four were taken prisoners and there is also a monument to his memory in France so I thought we'd stop and visit him and what an interesting piece of history for us. So we're here at Frank, I think it's Hare, Hare, Hare. Um, who was he? It seems like kind of a plain monument. Well, he was a gangster. He was a victim of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre on February 14th, 1929. He was an accountant for the Moran Rob. He was sentenced in 1915 for confidence game conviction and he was the leaseholder of the garage where the Valentine's Day Massacre um, occurred. Um, he had a total of about 15 bullet holes in his body from the autopsy. All right, we're going to go this way. All right, so why are we in this open field? These are the unmarked graves of some of the victims from the smallpox epidemic in Chicago of 18, between 1880 and 1881. So around uh, 1,200 people died in 1881 and around 1,300 in 1882 and people died so quickly that a lot of uh, the deceased did not have time to have an official plot. And so this is uh, a mass grave for a lot of those victims. Um, also while we're standing here, and you can see behind me the Eisenhower. So as I mentioned, the Eisenhower came through between the two cemeteries and uh, you know, close to uh, 2,000, 2,500 bodies had to be moved. And um, I don't know if you've driven on that part of the Eisenhower, but quite often there's a um, traffic jam, and I like to think it's the deceased getting back at us. All right, we're gonna keep going this way. So right behind me is one of the most beautiful vaults here at the cemetery, and it's empty. So if you would like to have it, I think it's still for sale. This vault was originally built for um, the Lehman family, and they established the Fair Department Store, which was sort of an innovator in department stores. Um, and they also believed that uh, Mr. Lehman had been here to help when this was a picnic ground as well. There's some reports that he was the pilot of a boat on the displays that was pulled by geese. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. At one point, there were six bodies here. But in the 1920s, a much more fashionable cemetery was established. And uh, Graceland in Chicago was where all the hoi polloi were buried. And so the Lehmans removed their bodies to go to Graceland. So again, uh, as we mentioned, our sponsors are the Troost Monument Company, and this is Frank Troost. There are many other Troost family members buried here in Forest Park. Um, not only uh, is it one of the largest monument companies, but it was also instrumental in um, developing the vault. So um, in old graveyards, there would be a lot of times the, when the uh, casket would decay, there would be a depression in the ground. And um, when you make a concrete vault, 
that keeps the ground level, which is uh, very necessary for modern cemeteries now that we have machines that drive over graves to mow. Um, and I should have mentioned also Forest Park Cemetery, Forest Home Cemetery is built on the uh, garden approach to a cemetery. So if you think back, you know, graveyards used to be next to churchyards and they, again, they would have those depressions and be very dangerous. And this was meant to be very naturalistic, uh, very much like a garden outside. So we have the Truce family to thank for us being able to walk amongst these uh, cemeteries. Um, we'll see a couple of other uh, monuments to Truce family members. So we're gonna see a lot of really awesome symbolism throughout the cemetery. And I thought we would just take a moment to look at this one. We'll look at other ones as well. But on top, there's the urn that is covered with a drape or a pall. Um, some that the urn represents life and that the drape being pulled back is sort of the mysteries of life and death being revealed. Or it could also be seen as a sign of mourning for it to be covered. On this headstone, this is a great one to look at too. Like I said, uh, this part of the cemetery was started off uh, as a German cemetery, German language. And so there'll be a lot of uh, graves with uh, German engraved on them. And then there's also some more symbolism here, the two hands being held. So it could be friendship, love. It could also be reaching across to, uh, to the other world. And then a rose on top of it, which is life and you know reaffirming that life goes on. So there's an awful lot of symbolism in all of these graves. So I just wanted to point out while we're here, um, like I said, there's so much symbolism here and I'll try to touch on a lot of it, but a lot of female figures, which is a very Victorian you know, sign of mourning, these mournful women. And in this, you'll see some anchors. Um, sometimes it could be that the deceased was uh, a sailor, but more often than not, it's a sign of Christianity. So because the anchor can look like a cross, and also uh, in scriptures, there is a quote that the um, hope is an anchor for the soul. So we're gonna end up seeing quite a number of anchors throughout the cemetery. Let's keep going. So this monument, which looks like it's being crowded by the tree and leaning over a little bit, if you look at the top, there's an owl. And in carved, uh, carved around the owl are the words Frisch, Frere, Stark, Troia, which is fresh, free, strong, and true. So this is a symbol of the Turners. The, the Turners were a, gymnastics, a German gymnastics club, and um, they prom promoted German culture, physical culture, liberal politics. They supported the Union during the uh, Civil War. Um, and like I said, it was so important that fraternal organizations or uh, organizations could, um, you could put this symbolism on your graves here. Also is interesting here, and unfortunately it's been damaged, um, there's also some graves that have uh, enameled portraiture or uh, photographs that would be placed on some of the graves, and you could see a photograph of the person. Um, also in Forest Park is a German wald, uh, Jewish Waldheim, so the Jewish cemetery that's further south of here. Many, many of those graves have these porcelain portraitures on them that's fascinating to go see. But um, this family here, they were members of the Turners. They were involved in physical education and German culture and liberal politics. All right, we're gonna keep going. So while we're over here, there's some great uh, symbolism on this grave here. On top is an open book. Um, so sort of like the Book of Life, um, com perhaps not quite completed, why it's uh, unwritten on. And then also here are, um, you'll see it looks like logs. The book is resting on a log. So that was also a movement towards more naturalistic symbolism. We'll see a lot of trees in the cemetery. Sometimes the trees are um, uh, the monuments. They're not actual trees. You know, they're cut off short because maybe the life was cut off short or limbs are cut off that could be members of the family that are deceased. We'll see some more of that symbolism. But uh, I love that this one has both the Book of Life and the naturalistic symbolism. Let's keep going. So this is a, a very often visited marker. This was a young girl that died when she was uh, one year old, Wilhelmina Price. Or Price. Um, on the side in German, it says that she was the granddaughter of the people that are buried next to her. Um, you can tell that uh, you know the time has not been kind to this monument; it has sort of worn away the features. Um, there's uh, the um, the ruffles of her dress, her shoes. Um, people come. We're going to visit another monument uh, to little kids, but people come and often leave gifts. So these flowers are actually not part of the monument. Somebody has come and left them uh, for her. She's a very uh, very photographed feature here at Forest Home. 
So this is a great example of all of the symbolism. Um, I don't know who Sophia Ambrose is, but uh, as you can tell, so the Book of Life, and it has the details of her life up here. And then uh, the anchor, again, a symbolism of Christianity. It looks like a cross. Jesus was a sailor. Hope is the anchor, the soul. Here are hands reaching across, so maybe reaching across the Great Divide. Um, ivy, which is sort of a symbolism of uh, eternal life coming back. And then the entire monument is the tree. And as I said, it's uh, cut off uh, short, and the branches are cut off as a sign of a, of a life, somebody leaving us too soon. So this magnificent monument is to the United Ancient Order of Druids. So the United Ancient Order of the Druids broke off from the Ancient Order of the Druids in 1833. The Ancient Order of the Druids were formed in 1781. And the reason why the United Ancient Order of the Druids broke off is because they wanted to be open to a more broader class of people. So while these aren't direct descendants of the Druids, because they were formed in the late 1800s, um, they sort of emulated what they believed the Druids stood for, which was a lot about uh, nature. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of really interesting uh, symbolism here again. Uh, when you're here in person, you will see that everybody here is buried in concentric circles. So sort of like the circle of life. And um, what delineates the lines of the circle are a lot of uh, logs or you know representations of logs. Um, at the very top, of the monument is a cloaked figure, a druid figure. Some people refer to him as Merlin. Um, he's holding a scythe and he's also holding a, sort of a staff with a, a, a head on top of it. Also on the monument you will see uh, a symbolism for the all-seeing eye. So the uh, last lodge closed in England in uh, 1999 but uh, in Australia, Germany, and Northern Europe, there are still some chapters of the Druids, and the Druids of California still exist. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that uh, buried in these concentric circles are also women. Sometimes fraternal organizations did not include women in their burial plots, but the, uh, the Druids did. It's a beautiful monument to come see. This monument behind me was erected in 1884. It's the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. The Independent Order of Odd Fellows was founded in uh, 1819. It was a non-political, non-sectarian split from the uh, English branch of Odd Fellows that was established in the 1700s. Um, this monument behind me was erected to the German branches of the Odd Fellows. Uh, the German branches of the Odd Fellows were outlawed during World War I. Uh, You'll quite often see the three linked chains on graves for people that were Odd Fellows, and that stands for friendship, love, and truth. Um, this monument also, uh, again, at the top, you were going to see that anchor that we've seen before at other um, markers. But uh, you'll, we'll see many linked chains uh, throughout the cemetery. There were quite a number of Odd Fellows. So besides the Haymarket Monument, this is probably one of the most visited uh, sites here in the cemetery. Um, these are uh, two boys, Lars and Eddie. Lars was six and Eddie was two. They lived in Chicago. They died of diphtheria two days apart. Um, they're both boys, even though it looks like one is uh, a girl. It was the custom back then to dress boys in skirts. Um, sadly, the uh, legs have been lost on the, the one boy. Um, it also is a reminder when you come to these old cemeteries um, just how common uh, death was for young children. Uh, because of diseases that we now have vaccines for. This is the marker for Joseph Carter Corbin. Uh, he was born to slaves. He was an educator, a journalist, scholar, linguist, mathematician, and, and a musician. He started the Branch Normal College for what was called the poorer classes. And he was an advocate for public education. In 2013, the University of Arkansas added this additional marker just to honor his contribution to um, higher education for African Americans. We're going to cross the river and go to the western part of the cemetery and then we'll be coming back to do some more on this side of the cemetery. But we're only able to do that because of the new bridge that was erected here in 2000. It replaced the previous bridge, which was 105 years old. And if you remember it at all, your definitely heart was in your throat crossing that bridge. It was a little treacherous. And um, the cemetery used to have a sign that said, may your crossing be blessed with eternal rest. So we're going to head over to the other side. 
So this is a monument to uh, the Columbia, so the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, it was Civil War veterans. Uh, it was founded in Decatur right after the Civil War. It was the largest veteran group at the time. So this was before the VA and before things like obviously VFW. Um, and there would be different posts. And so this was the Columbia post and uh, veterans are buried around here. Um, at one point there was a statue on top of it. We think maybe it was stolen in the 1980s. There was a lot of vandalism that happened in the cemetery in the 80s where people would steal things for um, the scrap metal value of it, which is so sad. Um, the GAR, the last member of the GAR of the, this group died in 1955 and the GAR was uh, discontinued in 1956. And we're gonna see another post when we go back to the other side of the river. So here we're at the grave of Barry and Paul, I don't know if it's Winder or Winder. Um, they both died in the Iroquois Theater fire. So in, uh, on December 30th, 1903, the Iroquois Theater fire was one of the deadliest theater fires. It's the deadliest single fire um, in the United States with 602 that perished. It was during the matinee of a show called Bluebeard. The theater was rushed into uh, completion and it was supposed to be fireproof but because they rushed it into being completed, they tried to catch the holiday crowds after Christmas. So um, the fire escapes were not finished. So many of the second floor fire escapes, there was a door, but there was no um, ladder to get down or stairs to get down. Some of the doors weren't finished and they were just painted or there were curtains over them. And also the locks uh, were very complicated to undo. Uh, we owe the Iroquois Theater fire to our quick release uh, doors in theaters. The theater was also designed so that there was just one massive staircase that went up which you know fed the fire with a lot of wind. It was during the production um, uh, one of the lights sparked above the theater that caught the curtains on fire. Uh, Eddie Foy who was a very famous uh, performer at the time uh, came out on the stage to try to get everybody to um, remain calm. Uh, it didn't succeed. Unfortunately one of the performers was a dancer who was uh, hung high up above the rafters. Uh, when the fire started, they could not get her down. Uh, some of the people that perished, it was mostly mothers and children. Um, so like I said, on the second floor, they didn't have the stairs down from the escape. Across the alley, the alley is still there in Chicago. It's uh, off of Randolph and uh, State Street. Um, there was a college across the way and some of the college students tried to improvise sort of a ramp from building to building and uh, many people uh, actually fell from that ramp and perished in that alley. It's one of the haunted spots in Chicago to visit. But um, these are uh, two of the boys that perished during that uh, very disastrous matinee. So I know we talked about um, fraternal organizations and this, of course, you can tell from the symbolism, this is uh, the Masons. Um, uh, in this plot are people that belong to the Pleiades, uh, lodge of this uh, Masonic order. And uh, the reason why I want to stop here in particular is you can see um, the granite headstones of the members behind here and they're um, all pretty nice and in uh, really great shape. And then we're going to move just next door to look at another organization and see their markers. All right, so this is the International Alliance of Bill Posters and Billers of America, local number one. So it was a union for, you know, before TV and radio, if uh, you wanted to advertise something, you would plaster the town with uh, posters. And so this was the union. Um, if you belong to the union, you had burial privileges in the plot. And I think it's very interesting to see the difference between these markers, which are um, of a more mass produced, lower quality uh, compared to the neighbors with the Pleiades. Um, there is also another burial plot over here for the bill posters, but it's um, pretty much empty because this profession um, went away. But it's an interesting contrast to the neighbors. So now we're in the uh, Cambrian Benevolent so uh, Society of Chicago's plot and it's uh, Welsh, people of Welsh descent. And if you know anything about uh, Welsh names, it's um, the last name of Pew, there's uh, Jones, Robert Hughes, um, Robert Lloyd, Llewellyn Jones. And then what I found was so interesting is uh, on the backs of here are um, the, the writings in Welsh. Um, so it's an interesting section. It's uh, the oldest Welsh society in Chicago. And in, um, it was in 1853, it was established to help Welsh people in Chicago on hard times. And during the World's Fair in 1893, they had a big Welsh cultural festival. Let's keep going. 
Uh, so this is Dr. Bernard Fantis, and he was the founder of the first blood bank. So if you think about it, before this, it was very difficult to have surgery that required a, a lot of blood because they couldn't store it or they didn't have a way for people to donate. So Dr. Fanis was the one who was, uh, he's a humanitarian and physician, as it says on his marker. And uh, there, um, there was a clinic named after him at Cook County. I don't know if it still stands, but Dr. Fanis is buried here. Let's keep going. There's so many cool, quirky things to discover in the cemetery. Um, so on one of my walks here, I noticed this grave. Uh, it's hard to read, but at the top it says, I'll plant you now and dig you later, which is a great sentiment. And then in the lower corner here is an arrow. And I was looking at it and I followed the arrow and it points over to here to Mary Ann Winkle's grave. And she has an arrow pointing right back at David. And on uh, David's it says, long companion of Mary Ann Winkle. So they were companions. Um, I don't, in my imagination, I noticed that uh, David has a star of David, so he was probably Jewish. And when I tried to look up anything about Mary Ann, I noticed that she was, um, her services were in a Christian um, uh, service, a Christian service. So maybe they couldn't get married because of their uh, religious differences. I don't know, but I just love the arrows pointing to each other and it worked because I discovered the two of them walking. In this mausoleum, which has no name on it, are buried Paul and Lynn Harvey. So some of you might remember Paul Harvey. He was a national uh, radio broadcaster, very well known, had a syndicated program. Um, he started in 1933. He was syndicated in 1951. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005. His wife, Lynn, who went by the name Angel, she produced his programs and she created the program, The Rest of the Story. She was called the First Lady of Radio. He had a very distinctive style and if you knew Paul Harvey, you can hear his voice in your head. So we are at this beautiful mausoleum of Adolf Joaquin Sabbath. He was a U.S. Congressman, also the Chairman of the House Rules Committee. He was a delegate to every Democratic convention from 1896 to 1944, and he served in the U.S. Congress from 1906 until his death in 1952, so 46 years in Congress. He was an ardent New Dealer. He was an advocate for old age pension, also for workers' comp, the GI Bill. He was pre-immigrant. He was pre-collective collective gardening, uh, bleh, <laughs> collective bargaining, probably collective gardening as well, and the FDIC. And uh, more importantly to me, he opposed prohibition. <laughs> you will also see it says that he is honored as a, a patriot, a statesman, and a loyal friend. So this is a monument to the um, uh, Cigar Makers International Union. Um, part of the monument was, uh, again, uh, damaged, stolen. There used to be a brass plaque on here. But what's really interesting in the lower left-hand corner, if you could see that, that was the label that was put on cigars. So what happened was, uh, during the Industrial Revolution, um, cigar making cigars became uh, uh, automated. And so the uh, workers had crafted handmade cigars were being put out of business. And so um, the other gentleman that is buried here, uh, Adolf Strasser, came up with the idea of putting on a union label on the cigars so that you could identify a high quality cigar. And that's what's on this marker. Um, Adolf Strasser, he was, uh, he was a organized, founding organizer of the AFL, the um, American Federal Federation of Labor. And he was a secretary under Samuel Gompers in the 1870s. Um, that's when he came up with the union label. Uh, he died in poverty and when his union brothers discovered that uh, he was in an unmarked grave, they brought his body here so that it could be uh, by the monument to the Cigar Makers Union. So a lot of cemeteries will have areas that where there's primarily little children. Uh, some cemeteries call them baby lands. Um, we'll see here, uh, it's our, the section here is actually called Heavenly Angels, but this is a little a uh, pocket of primarily uh, young burials. And um, I noticed this headstone, baby lover barrel, um, only lived a year. Um, and I wonder if the death is 1918, could be a victim of the Spanish flu. Um, it just, when we see other graves throughout the cemetery from 1918, it makes you think about the previous pandemic uh, before our current pandemic. So I know I promised another GAR post, and this is it. This is the Phil Sheridan Post 615. 
And you'll see on top of the monument, this is the only iron mortar found in the Chicago area cemetery. I kept calling it a cannon and my husband kept uh, correcting me that it's a mortar. Um, the last survivor of the Sheridan GIR sold the rest of the plots to veterans of the Spanish-American War. And um, on the side is uh, carved, Eternal Vigilance is the Price of Liberty. It's a pretty cool monument. So why are we standing here where there isn't a uh, marker? Well, buried here is quite possibly one of the few female serial killers in the United States. Belle Gunness was a woman who was born in the late 1800s in uh, Norway. And she came to the United States and she lived in Chicago with her husband, Mad Sorensen. And in the late 1800s, her, they had a candy shop in Chicago and it burned to the ground and they collected the insurance. And we think that's what started some ideas rolling around in Belle's head. After they collected the insurance, oh no, two of their children died under suspicious circumstances and they collected the insurance. Um, then her husband died. Oh, she collected the insurance and then she moved to Indiana. She had a second husband in Indiana. There was one day when both of his life insurance policies overlapped. On that day, oh no, he died. Something fell off a shelf and he died from a head injury. Um, she collected both insurance policies. Then she decided she didn't have to marry these gentlemen anymore and she sent out ads, sort of like a Lonely Heart ad, uh, advertising for uh, a husband saying that she was a rich widow with a beautiful piece of property in LaPorte, Indiana. Well, men would answer these ads and then, then they left, uh, mysteriously leaving all of their belongings behind for Belle. Well, one of these men, his brother, decided to come and investigate where his brother disappeared to. Right before he got to the farm to investigate, oh no, the farm burned down. And when they were going through the ashes in the basement, they discovered the remains of Belle's remaining uh, children, uh, as well as the headless body of a woman. The uh, police at the time said, oh, we're so sorry, you're never gonna find out what happened to your brother because of this horrible fire. But before he left the property, he noticed some um, indentations in the ground near where the pigs were, and he decided to investigate. Uh, at the end, they unearthed the remains of maybe 40 other men, um, also the remains of one of Belle's other, daughter, other daughters, whom she had told people had gone off to California uh, to go to school. So now the question was, was that body, the headless body, they never found the head, in the basement, was that really Belle? Um, Belle was a very large woman. The body that was uh, recovered was not so uh, not such a tall person. Um, it went back and forth. They decided that that was Belle and her remains were brought here. In 2008, someone trying to you know unravel this 100 year old mystery, they exhumed the body, they collected some DNA and they hoped to match it with the DNA. They had some letters that Belle had sent for the correspondence trying to get you know a husband and uh, unfortunately the sample was uh, too old to be conclusive. So the mystery is still unsolved. Is Belle here? We don't know. This is one of several um, markers here in the cemetery that's designed by Tiffany. You can see how beautiful this Celtic cross is. Um, also the uh, markers here are just beautiful Celtic artwork. Um, it's Erskine Richardson and um, Dan Erskine Richardson. I don't know a lot about the, uh, about the Richardsons. Um, so if anybody wants to let me know if they know something more, I don't know if uh, they were architects, but uh, these are just phenomenally beautiful uh, markers designed by Tiffany. We're standing in front of this beautiful mausoleum. Uh, it's William C. Grunauer. He produced majestic radios, which used AC instead of messy batteries. Uh, fun fact, he had a mansion in River Forest. It was later bought by mobster Tony Accardo. Uh, after working on radios, he went on to raise poultry under the uh, label Val Low Will Farms in Lake Geneva, which were named for his kids, Valerie, Lois, and William. But it's a beautiful mausoleum, and uh, we'll have to take a peek at the statues on either side. And I want you to notice something about the statue um, on the north side of the mausoleum. Uh, when you look at it, it's a beautiful Art Deco design, and if you look closely, you'll notice that she's wearing earphones, like for the radio, and she's called the Spirit of Radio. So this area behind me is uh, referred to as Heavenly Angels. In other cemeteries, like I mentioned, sometimes they're called Babyland. Um, it's primarily um, 
young children or babies that are buried here. Um, and this is in the corner of the cemetery. A lot of times you'll see things like balloons or stuffed animals left for the children that are buried here. So in keeping with the theme of fraternal organizations here in the cemetery, I wanted to make sure we stopped and uh, visited uh, this marker, um, primarily because the emblem of the Woodman of the World is so nice and prevalent on here. A lot of the, uh, uh, the Woodman of the World was another fraternal organization, and a lot of the uh, markers them are uh, trees, or they look like trees and logs, but this one actually has you know, the nice insignia on it. And I thought it would be a good place to talk about the Woodmen of the World. A lot of these fraternal organizations um, also provided, you know, uh, benefits uh, for burials, uh, financial aid, and so the Woodmen of the World, at Wood, Woodmen of the World, actually became Woodman Life in 2015. Uh, evolved into an insurance uh, company, but the uh, Woodmen of the World, their um, motto is "Dumb Taget Clamat," though silent he speaks. It was founded in 1890 in Omaha, and uh, it was uh, meant to clear away problems of financial security for its members. But it's a really uh, lovely um, marker where you can really see their logo. All right, let's move on. So, um, you know, there's many themes that we find in the cemetery. Uh, of course, all the fraternal organizations. And also here in Forest Park is um, many uh, people that were involved in the labor movement, very important people in the labor movement. Um, at the end of the tour, we're gonna visit the Haymarket Monument and uh, Radical Row, which are uh, labor leaders buried near the Haymarket Monument. Um, we're quite a ways in the cemetery from that monument, but here we find someone who was buried, and uh, most importantly, on his headstone is the logo for the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. This is an organization or, uh, sometimes known as the Wobblies. It was founded in Chicago, um, a very important um, movement in the labor movement. Um, it's a union for all. Um, Mark Rogovin, who gave the tours of the Haymarket Monument for many years, who recently passed, uh, when, uh, we found, when he found this, he believed that this might be one of the very few markers with the IWW uh, emblem on it. He certainly hadn't seen any other ones. And also on this monument at the very bottom, which is difficult to see, it says uh, OMP. And uh, we're not quite sure what that means, but it could be the Order of Mutual Protection, which was founded in 1878. But it just shows that there are probably many others uh, buried in a cemetery that were brought here because of the Haymarket Martyrs um, that are yet to be discovered here in Forest Park. All right, let's see what else we can find. Okay, so now we're gonna visit a real overachiever. So Samuel Fallows, he uh, entered the Civil War as a chaplain, but once he got to the battlefield, um, he realized that he could serve the country, um, not uh, just in a religious capacity, but he uh, ended up commanding troops in combat, ended up becoming a, a brigadier general, and then when he left the service, he then became the bishop of the Reformed Episcopal Church. So um, quite a lot of achievements for somebody in a lifetime. So I'm standing on top of one of the, um, on, an, on top of a Potawatomi uh, burial mound. Um, as we mentioned earlier, originally this was the site of a Potawatomi village and there were other mounds here. Uh, this one is remaining. Um, in the 1850s, uh, the um, Frederick, Ferdinand Haas's uh, in-laws that were on a neighboring farm, uh, when they passed away, uh, he actually buried them on top of this mound. So those were the first uh, people of European descent uh, buried here in this uh, cemetery and then actually were buried on top of this mound. Uh, this is a marker that is um, just reminding us of what was here originally, um, talking about the Potawatomi who were here and how they were forced to move west. Um, I might have mentioned earlier, there were many other mounds that were located here and when the site was excavated for the railroad to get the gravel for the railroad and also for some um, apartment buildings that were uh, constructed on the south side of this, unfortunately some of those burial mounds were disturbed um, and the items, uh, some of the items were donated to the Forest Park Library which, and those items have now been repatriated to museums for Native Americans. But um, this is most definitely an important stop here in the cemetery and to remember 
you know, who was here first. So I actually don't know anything about this gentleman that's buried here. And so if you find out something, please let the Historical Society know. Um, I might have mentioned this is one of my very favorite places just to come and take a walk. And you quite often discover some uh, sites that you would love to do more research on. And I've tried to find some information. This is William H. Wilson and he was born in 1873 and died in 1935 but what drew, drew me was just the unique portrait of him uh, in bronze here it's so beautiful and haunting and it just makes me think that this must have been someone who was accomplished in their lifetime and um, I need to do some more digging to find out who he is but it definitely is still worth a visit because it's such a beautiful marker and then we're gonna move on right by him for somebody else so I know we visited um, the uh, mausoleum of a very well-respected U.S. Senator. This here is Frederick London. He was a U U.S. Congressman from 1909 to 1911 and a member of the U Illinois State Senate from 1894 until 1898. He was described as a flim-flam man, so he sold what was called a juniper aid to uh, tonic. He was also involved in kickback schemes with Big Bill Thompson in 1915. He was a political boss. He built up an organized crime syndicate that was later taken over by Al Capone in 1922. So we have uh, famous and infamous people here in the cemetery. So while we're over in this corner of the cemetery, I just thought I'd point out that across the street is Jewish Waldheim. Um, it's another fascinating cemetery. Hopefully we'll do a tour of uh, that cemetery at some point. If you are down in the area and you want to go for a walk, the really uh, interesting thing about the uh, Markers over there is quite a number of them have little en uh, enameled portraiture, and we've seen that in some of them here, but uh, they're very prominent in the uh, Jewish Waldheim, and there's some really uh, interesting people buried over there, so maybe a future tour. So uh, while we're here, this very interesting marker, um, the Ruse family is a very important family in Forest Park. They were furniture makers, um, very famously known for their cedar chests. Um, at one point, uh, girls would have what they would call a hope chest. It would be a cedar chest and they would put in linens and different things that um, they planned to use once they were married. And so the cedar chests made by Ruth were very popular and very famous. And so I think it's really interesting that this marker is in the shape of a bench. There are other members of the Ruth family buried throughout the cemetery, but I thought this was particularly interesting. So here we have Martha Louise Rain. And uh, she's fascinating. She's a groundbreaking woman journalist. And she uh, uh, was able to go places where other journalists couldn't go because she was a woman. And in fact, she interviewed Mary Todd Lincoln when she was in a mental institution in Batavia, Illinois. Um, very typical of women at the time. She had uh, 10 children, only two of whom had uh, survived into adulthood. In uh, 1860, she had to write for the Tribune under the pseudonym Vic because women journalists were you know, not very uh, welcome at the time. Um, she edited and owned the Chicago Magazine of Fashion, Music, and Home Reading. She wrote five novels and two nonfiction books. She opened up a school of journalism, um, the first one in the world, actually, and her book was uh, titled, What Can a Woman Do? Or Her Position in the Business and Literary World. So while she wasn't technically a feminist, she definitely, you know, was at the spearhead of women entering journalism. So important to come visit Martha Rain when you're here. So this is really, uh, we get two bangs for our buck uh, at this monument. So not only is this beautiful, so you can tell it's, um, you know, very naturalistic. It's a big boulder. Um, around it are uh, other boulders. Um, but the uh, folks that are buried here are also very interesting. So this is Junius R. Sloan and Sarah Spencer Sloan. So Junius was a painter and uh, he was uh, very well known for his landscapes and they were um, what was called an American look to the landscapes. And then she came from parents who, um, she's the daughter of Platt R. Spencer, who is the author of the Spencerian System of Penmanship. So uh, you can uh, look it up, I encourage you to look it up, but it was a very specific way to do cursive writing. So she was their daughter and she continued to be an advocate of that kind of um, style of handwriting and then she was also um, uh, a teacher and uh, so it's uh, they on here it says these two visioned and created beauty for the joy of it isn't that lovely okay so if you're a beer drinker 
Uh, this might be a, a monument you want to visit. So Edward G. Uline, he was, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, but he was a brewing company executive. He was the vice president of Schlitz Brewing. And he's most notably known for, um, if you're in Chicago, and sometimes you'll see a bar, and on the masonry work will be a Schlitz, um, the, the uh, logo. So it's like the globe with the word Schlitz across it. Um, particularly at Shubas, if you know Shubas in Chicago. So that was his idea, so that you would have a branded pub or a saloon that sold Schlitz beer, and then you would put that as part of the masonry work. And that was his marketing idea. So um, I know I get thirsty when I come visit this monument. So why are we stopping here? Um, and this is one of these items in the cemetery that I would love some more information about if we could get it. There's no plaque here, but according to um, the literature that the cemetery has for interesting places to visit in the cemetery, this was a hitching post from Fort Dearborn in Chicago. And uh, the story goes that it was uh, moved here, uh, donated by the Gale family, which is an important family in uh, Oak Park, the history of Oak Park. And there are rings to the side where you could see where somebody could uh, tie up a horse, so it could very well be a hitching post, but there's no uh, marker here at all. So if anybody has more information about this hitching post, uh, contact the Historical Society so we can fill in some detail. So this is interesting because of what it's made, of course it's lovely to look at, but also it's really interesting for what it's made from. Um, I don't know if you can tell that it definitely has a much different tint than the other markers around it, and that's because it is made out of zinc. Uh, or what they called white bronze at the time. Uh, when these were uh, being marketed as uh, grave markers, um, they were thought of as kind of tacky. They were on the inexpensive end, and you could actually order them in pieces. So it was kind of a mix and match, and they were a little bit looked down on because they were inexpensive. But what's uh, ironic is how, much, how well they have withstood the uh, time. The details on these uh, definitely have um, weathered much better than stuff that's maybe engraved in granite or marble. Um, so it's interesting, something that they thought was uh, cheap has uh, held up better over time. So uh, while we're talking about the uh, zinc uh, monuments, I just thought I'd point out while we're in this area, here's another good example of something made out of that white tin or zinc and um, just how well it's held up. Um, it's lovely. Okay, so behind me are a bunch of vaults that are um, placed in what remains of that glacial deposit we talked about earlier that was gravel. And this was an original uh, feature that ran throughout this area. And as we talked about before, it was excavated. Um, a lot of the gravel sold to the railroads. Um, they believed, you know, obviously before these vaults were here, that this might have been an open air assembly area for the Potawatomi. Um, you could see how a ridge like this would be used for trails because it was not soggy and above, you know, the, the what could have been the marshy prairie. But uh, obviously now with the cemetery, they have placed various vaults here. Uh, a lot of them have not held up that well, um, but they're definitely a popular place for people to come visit, especially uh, as it gets closer to Halloween. All right, so this is where Ferdinand Haas is buried, uh, and he lived from uh, 1826 to 1911. And if you remember way back at the beginning of the tour, when I talked about the history of this land, so Ferdinand Haas was the farmer who bought the land from the French trapper who was here with his Potawatomi wife. And he was the one that was originally a farm, then it became a picnic ground, and then he established uh, the cemetery. So this is uh, that Ferdinand Haas. So this incredibly beautiful monument, um, the design is just gorgeous. A lot of Celtic and then also Art Nouveau. On the other side is uh, a figure that uh, is very striking. And uh, when you look at it, it is standing on a wheel. And then there's uh, wings by it for transportation. So this is Edmund Cummings. So uh, Edmund Cummings fought in the Civil War. He served with Grant at Vicksburg and Sherman on their march to the sea. And he was in the GAR. If you remember, we visited some of those uh, posts, the uh, Grand Army of the Republic. He was in the GAR. Then he went into real estate, um, very uh, successful in real estate. And then they realized in order for people to get to their properties that they were selling in the real estate, that it would be great to have a railway company. So now we're back to the wheel. And he founded the Cicero and Proviso Street Railway Company, and it was an electric streetcar. Originally, uh, this 
plot here had a lot more, um, they had a lot of flowers and um, it formed a big wheel with uh, the spokes leading to the various uh, family members that are buried here with one uh, spoke of the wheel um, very symbolically broken. The other uh, cool thing about this monument and it's uh, how beautiful it is, it was uh, designed by Tiffany again. Um, this one is not signed like the other monument we visited, um, but this is very dramatic and beautiful to visit in person. So uh, in front of me here are the headstones for Ernest Hemingway's parents. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, of course, very famous American writer. Uh, his boyhood home was nearby in Oak Park and his parents, um, she was a, Grace was a singer and she gave up her uh, career. She was a, um, a very good singer. She, in fact, performed at Madison Square Garden. She was a suffragette, she was a painter, and she also taught music. She gave up her career when she married uh, Clarence, who was a doctor. They met when he was taking care of her parents and they, their relationship uh, blossomed when he would come back and forth to take care of her parents. Um, they, uh, they had five children um, he uh, committed suicide. There is, um, if you know the history of the Hemingway family, there were quite a number of suicides in the Hemingway family. And there's some speculation that um, he suffered from a blood condition that uh, caused a lot of iron to um, accumulate in his blood. And they think that that might make people prone to suicide and that's a, uh, something that's hereditary. Uh, he shot himself with his father's Civil War pistol. Um, on his headstone says John 15, 13, and that quote is, greater love has no, man than, has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. And on graces, it's Psalm 28, 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield, my heart trusts in him and I am helped. Every time I come to visit their uh, headstones and I stand uh, in front of it, I think of Ernest, I'm sure, stood there. So you can feel a little bit of a, a direct connection with a very famous uh, American writer. All right, we're going to keep going. We are standing in front of the grave of Billy Sunday. Um, and in a little bit, we're going to talk about uh, Emma Goldman. Um, uh, they had Emma Goldman and Billy Sunday. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about, about Billy Sunday first. So he started off life as a professional baseball player, and he played for the Chicago White Stockings in the 1880s. In 1886, he, was, he went by the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago and uh, had a revelation, and he decided to go into being a preacher. So he became an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, and he was a revivalist, and he uh, established what he called Walk the Sawdust Trail. So he'd have big tent meetings. Uh, he was very conservative. He was against scientists, radicals, liberals. Um, if you're familiar at all with the book or movie Elmer, Elmer Gantry, it was a book written by Upton Sinclair, which I highly recommend you read. Um, that character is based on Billy Sunday. Um, if you know the song, Chicago, 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 one of the lines is the town that Billy Sunday could not shut down. This is that Billy Sunday. Uh, on his headstone, it says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So as uh, we'll see later on, Emma Goldman, who is a very famous anarchist, is buried here as well. The two of them had uh, uh, a feud that was uh, played out in the press. And I think the two of them would be very unhappy that their final homes are in the same cemetery. Um, and uh, I can tell you that Emma Goldman's grave is visited much more frequently than poor old Billy Sunday. So again, something quirky, you never know what you're going to find when you're uh, walking around. So I uh, came across this during one of my walks. Um, you know, it's St. Francis of Assisi, of course, a uh, saint that was very, um, you know, associated with care of animals. Um, I don't know why this is here, it's kind of tucked away. Um, my suspicion completely uncorroborated is that maybe at one time they thought they would maybe have a corner of this cemetery for pets. That's my guess. Or somebody just could have wanted something for uh, St. Francis here in a lovely corner of the graveyard. So um, this is another example of just how still vibrant in modern history this uh, cemetery is. And uh, this is the marker for uh, Laquan McDonald. Um, very tragic story. He was a 17 year old who was carrying um, a knife in the city and he was shot by the Chicago Police Department 16 times. Um, it has changed the oversight of the Chicago Police Department and is still obviously a very powerful, um, a very powerful event in our history that's still trying to motivate change. And um, it's an honor to be able to come and visit Laquan's um, memorial here. 
So uh, in 1942, this uh, marker here was placed to uh, again honor the heritage of the Native Americans who were here originally. And uh, I'll just read this. It says, an ancient Indian trail once passed this boulder, skirting the forest along the Des Plaines River through groves of wild plum and hazel thickets. Eastward, the tall grass of the prairie stretched as far as the eyes could reach. Later, it served as a road for the early settlers in the long months when the flooded prairies were impassable. May those who now follow this trail gain comfort from nature's peace and beauty. So from 1942. So the area behind me is uh, a segment, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe. And um, the story that I had heard is that someone had seen in one of the trees behind us what appeared to be Our Lady of Guadalupe in the tree. And that is what has drawn many uh, Latinx families to bury their loved ones here. Uh, very much like the Roma, the uh, traditions are very exuberant. There's quite a lot of items that are brought to the graves like um, uh, flowers and balloons and pinwheels and it's especially vibrant during uh, Dia de los Muertos. So again without any official confirmation uh, this is what I believe is the tree where someone might have seen an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe in the shadow of the tree there. So uh, this monument is to two that we're going to be visiting and we're going to start on this side and um, this is William Gray and William Gray edited uh, a spiritual magazine, The Interior. Um, and on the other side is his uh, grandson who lived with him, who became a, um, a very well-known uh, architect in the Prairie School. The other cool thing about, uh, on both sides of this monument, are the headstones for the couples that are buried here. So it, it's the husband and the wife, their um, signatures, and then they had the year that they were married in between. It's a very uh, unique feature, I think, of this grave. This is another really beautiful monument to come see in person. Um, I don't know if it's designed by Tiffany. It certainly is reminiscent of the other Celtic crosses that we saw, uh, but the detail in it is just incredible. Um, this is Edward Hand Pitkin and Lily Mori Pitkin. So uh, Edward had the China, uh, was a China company. He was an executive. Uh, he was a college trustee. He served in the Civil War, and he had a store that was on the corner of State and Lake in Chicago. Lily was a suffragette, and she was a school board member. She was the first elected woman uh, official in Oak Park in 1893. So yeah, again, the detail on this is just the, the Celtic crosswork, and then um, the ivy climbing up of it is um, just beautiful. So if you come out this way to Oak Park, I'm sure you're quite familiar with Austin Boulevard. Uh, named after Henry Austin, who was buried here. He was a community builder. Um, he was a temperance advocate. So uh, if you remember, if you know your Oak Park history, you'll know that Oak Park for, for quite a long time was a dry town. I think it still technically is, but you, you can have a, um, you can serve alcohol if you also serve food. Um, he, this is also the um, grave of his daughter. Uh, she died when she was eight years old. Um, uh, she's above ground because her father couldn't bear the thought of her being buried under the ground. So that's the uh, Austin family. So this is the grave of Doris Humphrey. She was an amazing woman. She was a dancer and choreographer. Uh, she helped pioneer the art of modern dance along with Isadora Duncan and Martha Graham. Uh, she wrote a book called The Art of Making Dances, which is still used today, uh, pioneer in dance. So we are at the grave of Friedrich and Frederica Woldersdorf. There goes my German. Um, sadly, I don't know much about uh, these folks that are buried here, but it is such a striking monument. Um, it's so beautifully done, and uh, I know it's difficult for you to see, but here uh, engraved underneath the, the little portrait of, um, I'm assuming, uh, Friedrich, it says, Erund Achtung dem Mannen, which means uh, pay honor to the man or pay, pay privileges to the man. So I, I'm not sure how I feel about that as a modern woman with the two women looking adoringly at the floating head and paying honor to him, but um, it is a, a beautiful uh, monument. So the next two graves that we're gonna stop at, uh, again, like I said, sometimes I come through here and I see something interesting and then thank goodness for the internet, I'm able to find out a little bit more of the stories of the people that are buried here. Uh, it's almost impossible, uh, I'm sure, for you to read this, but I was able to make out the name on this gravestone. And I thought, of course, it was interesting because of the train. And this is Herbert Clark Van Every. 
and I was able to find his obituary, and he died from shock and injuries from the giving way of the crown sheet of the C and NW Railroad Company's freight engine, number 770, while he was working on the engine. So I think uh, it's very interesting um, that they, the family chose to uh, not only honor him with the headstone, but to actually put the train on the headstone. Um, so you never know what you're going to find here. So this might be one of my very favorite finds here uh, in the cemetery. Um, as I was hiking around, I noticed uh, this uh, marker here, and you can uh, probably tell that there was once an, once an arch across the top and it broke. Uh, and again, here's our anchor for Christianity. But if you look, it says the Reverend Morrill Twins. And so uh, very fortunate again that there was information on the internet about the Reverend Morrill Twins. And they were identical twins and they were both Baptist ministers. They were evangelicals and they had their own um, calling, their own church, and they worked primarily with sailors. And at one point they built a building that looked like a ship in Chicago and they called it the gospel ship. And they had very uh, vigorous, loud uh, sermons full of profanity. And it was very shocking to people at the time. And in fact, they were uh, attacked several times. Their secretary, somebody tried to throw uh, uh, acid on her face. Uh, they were robbed, they were set on fire. Um, very prominently on the uh, pulpit behind them, they kept firearms so that they could show people if they were gonna, there was gonna be mob action, they were ready to defend themselves. Um, and uh, sadly, you know, one of the brothers uh, died before the other and that was the end of their very eccentric uh, career uh, preaching. Um, there's some amazing pictures of them. Uh, they were quite often went around on a bicycle built for two, dressed identically. Um, I would love for somebody to make a movie about the Reverend Morrill twins. So I'm sad to say I don't know anything about the Earhart family. Uh, I can see that uh, Lewis uh, looks like maybe he's the oldest of the family here, uh, born in 1851 and died in 1913. Um, but the, the, uh, the artwork on this uh, stone is so beautiful and so evocative so it's just one of my favorite places to come and visit when I'm walking. Uh, again I don't know much about the Lepsky family but I think it's also worth just taking a look at this beautiful it's pretty typical of that kind of Victorian um, art of the morning she's holding a wreath of flowers very contemplative um, it's just a lovely a lovely sentiment here. And we're going to go to one more next door. And uh, here is another very lovely um, figure. Um, I think she's just so striking. And not only just her expression, of, she's very stoic. Um, and you get a sense of the fashions at the time as well. The details on her dress and her belt, her beaded belt. And then her hand is very dramatically on a broken pillar. And as we talked before, the broken pillar sort of being a symbolism of a life cut short. And then if we get a chance, we'll walk around to the back and just look at the detail of the back as well. And then just while, like we said at the back, it's so beautiful, the detail, again, of her dress, her hair, um, and then her hand that's behind her back is holding uh, a kerchief. And the detail on that is beautiful. You could see that there's uh, meant to be lace around the outside of the kerchief. Just beautiful details. And it has held up pretty well, all things considered. So here we have uh, a victim of the Eastland disaster. And those of you who know Chicago history, and you might have actually seen the tour of Concordia Cemetery, which also has some of the Eastland uh, victims. It was a terrible accident here in Chicago. Um, it was July 24th of 1915. It was a ship that was going for a picnic, and it was a company pick picnic from Western Electric. Uh, the capacity of the ship was 2,500. And what happened was as people started to board the ship, you know, with their picnic gear and they were waving to people um, you know on the dock and this was right you know in downtown Chicago so uh, Chicago River right there you know within arm's reach of people and because so many people were on one side of the boat it started to roll and uh, it did not recover itself and it rolled and 844 passengers and crew members uh, died and, and again 
basically within arm reach of people um, there on the shore. And I'd like to read a little bit of what was in the paper at the time. Rudolph Stork of 1027 Circle Avenue, his daughter Gertrude and son Rudolph were in the ill-fated Eastland. Gertrude expressed to her father a few minutes before the accident a feeling of fear that something wrong was going to happen. Rudolph and his son survived, but Gertrude, who was 15, uh, did not. So she was survived by her father, mother, and brother. So here we have a, a victim of the Eastland disaster. So there's so much more here to explore. In fact, um, we didn't make it today to uh, another notable that's buried here is the gentleman who wrote the lyrics to the State Song of Illinois. He's buried here um, and his monument has some of the lyrics written on it. So um, there's more, much more to discover here. Uh, we're ending by the Haymarket Monument. That is another video tour that you can see um, through the website at the Historical Society. Uh, that's takes another hour to sort through so many important um, facts and important people. Um, I want to again thank our sponsors and especially fitting that I'm here because Truce Monument uh, provided the stone for this beautiful bench that's uh, relatively new for the Haymarket. Um, and on it it says, sit and hear the voices for peace, justice, and freedom. And it's certainly a beautiful bench and a beautiful cemetery to visit. Um, if you have questions about uh, some of the sites we saw, you know, send an email to the Historical Society. I know people will do their best to answer them, and I encourage you to come out in person. This tour is usually done uh, on bike, so uh, look next year for the bike tour and join us. And uh, thanks again for joining us, and thanks to our sponsor, uh, Truce Monument.